La verdad que, que es una gran alegría tener a dos Master of Wine eh, con todo lo que eso significa. Eh, hay, hay pocas personas en el mundo, ahora es lo podrán decir, pero digamos, si no me equivoco, son poquito más de 300 personas en el mundo que son Master of Wine, así que es uno de los títulos probablemente más importantes que se pueden obtener con todo el conocimiento que eso conlleva, eh, así que cuando pensamos en la temática de, de Canadá y también en Michelle, también pensamos en, en cómo traer a, a Marina, que ahora vamos a contar un poquito, seguramente muchos la conocen, pero está bueno hablar de las dos. Así que vamos a empezar por la moderadora, que es Marina Gallán, que es la, es, fue la primera eh, Master of Wine que hubo en Sudamérica y sigue siendo hasta el día de hoy la única Master of Wine que hay en Argentina, así que es todo un orgullo. Eh, Marina vivió mucho tiempo en Londres, se mudó en 1999 eh, y en los últimos 20, 25 años estuvo relacionada al marketing, a la consultoría de vinos. Eh, estuvo y hace hasta el día de hoy eh, desarrollo de marca de vinos globales para mercados masivos y mercados premium, y siempre estuvo muy relacionada en temas eh, educativos, y hace dos años que volvió, eh, no sabemos si transitoriamente o no para quedarse, pero eh, a, a, a vivir a Buenos Aires, con lo cual eso, más allá del reconocimiento que tenía, la hizo estar mucho más en contacto con el mundo del vino en Argentina y con, y con todos los sommeliers. Así que Marina, una, una alegría y como siempre te hemos dicho, una, un gran agradecimiento que colabores con, con la asociación siempre que, siempre que puedas. Y and now I will switch to English uh, to present Michelle Ceruti. Michelle is a dual Italian Canadian citizen who left corporate life in Toronto, moving to London in UK to pursue her passion for wine. Today, she is a highly respected wine lecturer, having taught uh, wine industry professionals since 2004 at the Wine and Education Spirit, sorry, Wine and Spirit Education Trust, WZ, in London, where she is a consultant tutor specializing in Italy, regions in France, and the New World. Michelle is a frequent guest, wine expert, and major wine shows and wine competitions, including the Canter World Wine Awards and International Wine and Spirit Competition. Uh, so, of course, Michelle is a master of wine. She was uh, here in Argentina two years ago where, during the visit of uh, several master of wine uh, in coordination with Wine of Argentina. So, a uh, Very best pleasure to present Michelle Ceruti and Marina Gashan. So, all yours. Thank you very much. There you go. Sorry. Um, gracias, Matías, y hola a todos. Eh, voy a decir esta parte en español, que es que es un placer enorme poder participar con acciones de, o, o eventos de la Asociación de Sommeliers que era una asociación que no existía cuando yo me fui de Argentina, así que me perdí estos 20 años del crecimiento de la asociación y de los cambios eh, que ha habido acá, así que es un placer enorme. Michelle, you got all that, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah? All right. So, I'm switching to English now, so Michelle can understand me. As Matias said, you get two masters of wine for the price of one, but, um, but I am clearly the freebie, the free master of wine, because... Michelle is a super educator. She's uh, been in Master of Wine for five years, Michelle? Yeah, almost six, yeah. Yep, so I feel very old because I, <laughs> you know, I passed a bit earlier than you, <laughs> around 2003, oh my God. Um, and um, and she, she really takes um, what the mission of the Master of Wine of the Institute is to the next level, which is to uh, promote excellence in education and um, So it's, it's a pleasure to have Michelle today telling us about Canada. Uh, I know or I understand that in the career of sommeliers you study a bit of Ontario and a bit of British Columbia. So Michelle today is going to take us a bit more in depth of um, around the background, the history. Uh, um, she's going to talk about the different, the, the main three regions and of course about ice wine. I'm going to be um, picking up the, the questions. Monica is going to feed me the questions and I'll, I'll interrupt her many, many times, hopefully. 
Um, but I'll leave you with Michelle, who is the wine expert at talking about Canada today. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Mateus. It's, it goes without saying I would far rather be with you in Argentina to do this presentation. <laughs> Um, let me just share my screen. I've got a little presentation um, to share with you, but this hopefully will be quite interactive um, for everyone. Okay. Just a little bit of history of the Canadian wine industry, and uh, I'm not quite sure how many people realize that uh, there's actually been grapes here for a very, very long time. In fact, the northeast of Canada and the U.S. Uh, has their own native grapes. We all hear about North American rootstocks, but there are native species that cover and, and certainly covered both areas uh, historically. And in fact, when Leif Erikson, um, uh, the Viking, came over, he named, he landed in Newfoundland and he named the country Vineland. There were so many wild grapes. So. Uh, other than having native grapes, what I would call, uh, you know, the grapes that we sort of know and love and plant, they, that's the history I'll really go through. Uh, so if grapes are first planted in Nova Scotia, that's in 1611. Uh, as far as records go, these grapes uh, were, th there's, there's writings that speak about Bordeaux, but they do know that these were native grape varietals uh, and a few of them imported. Uh, I'll talk about Nova Scotia in depth, very difficult place to grow grapes, so it, it goes without saying it wasn't terribly successful. And we fast forward 200 years, and the first grapes were then planted in Ontario by Johann Schiller, and he was a German, and he actually went and got his grapes from Pennsylvania in the U.S., and so we do know this, we do know that they were native grape varietals, and at that time there were some hybrids around, so we had about 20 hectares, and that's the real first uh, what I'd call, you know, planting and serious viticulture that was recorded in Ontario. British Columbia a little bit later in 1859. And again, uh, similar to Ontario, they were, uh, they were native grapes to the US and Canada with the few hybrids as well. So the industry was quite rolling around, rolling along, it was progressing. And then we have something called prohibition which both in the US and Canada had at the time. So I'm not quite sure if people know what prohibition was. So that's the ban of the consumption of alcohol. Not quite, not dissimilar to what we're going now, going through now. But um, in Canada, you could produce alcohol, but uh, for export, so you couldn't consume it. And in the US, they couldn't produce and they couldn't consume. So it was enacted in various regions across the country. Canada is divided up into provinces, just like the U.S. is divided up into states. So uh, it really came into full being with World War II, so between 1916 and 1918. And that really caused a complete stop in the wine industry, not only the spirits industry, but the wine industry. So it really halted any progress at that time. Prohibition and it wasn't, there are a lot of people that weren't too happy about it, particularly in Quebec. So it was repealed at, in various different places from 1921 onwards. For most of the country by the 19, early 1930s, it was repealed with the exception of Prince Edward Island, which took until 1948. But for the most of it, it was repealed during that time. And that is earlier than, uh, than the US. What they did instead is they created government control of um, uh, the selling of alcohol to consumers. So what we would call today a monopoly. And that happened again in various different places. So the selling, drinking age, selling, production, all of that is controlled at a local level. It's all controlled at a provincial or regional level, just like it is in the US. So across Canada, We've got 10 provinces and a couple different territories. So we do have different laws with respect to drinking age. Um, and we've got different types of retail environments. For the most part, uh, the retail is controlled by a government monopoly, but not all of it, not all of it. In 1928, that's even further. So the government intervention even went further. So not only did they create stores, but then they decided to uh, really restrict movement. So as a consumer going to one province and bringing back alcohol to another province, 
uh, is restricted and in some cases illegal. And believe it or not, that still exists today. So it was upheld by the Supreme Court in 2018. So that's the history uh, of the country. Michelle, can I, can yeah. I ask you? What, yeah. was, this, um, was this like a, an ethical decision or was that that they had a problem with alcoholism or, or where does it come from such a strong? Yeah, it's a really good question. If you even look in the UK and different parts of Europe, what, what you would call the temperance movement, that's what it was called. There was a real movement. There was a real religious movement to mm. slow down any alcohol consumption. Uh, it happened in the UK. Like I said, it happened in various different European cities as well and it was just caught up in part of that to be honest and it really depended on the province so Quebec being you know the most sort of open province really repealed against it and so they only had prohibition for a few years but yeah it's the same in the US at that time um, mm -hmm. it, it I, I do like to say that prohibition there, there are things that are today very similar to prohibition and and uh, in prohibition in Canada, you could get a doctor's prescription and then you were allowed to legally go and buy alcohol, which is interesting. And that's no different to today, depending on where you are, getting a prescription for cannabis. So, you know, I, I like to think a hundred years later, sort of that sort of, you know, the way people look at that industry is not dissimilar to the way we looked at alcohol. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe in the end because, you know, mm. cannabis is now legal in Canada. Mm. And it is, yeah. it, it is one of the things that is impacting the industry uh, to a small degree. Oh. All right. um, so Canada today, so the, still the production and sale of alcohol is still controlled at that provincial level. Now it looks differently wherever you are. And I'm happy to say there is a bit of deregulation. So if any of you have ever done any trips to any sort of wine areas, you might've encountered somebody from, you know, from the liquor control board of Quebec or the liquor control board of Ontario. They're pretty powerful, powerful buying arms. You know, if you look at Ontario, you know, they have the monopoly to buy for 10 million people and they have over 600 stores. So it is, um, you know, it is a huge amount of control of the industry that's in the hands of the government. Um, and depending on the province, um, that looks slightly differently. So, you know, we have something called beer stores where you can buy beer separately and that's owned by the big brewers. And Alberta is the only province that does not have a monopoly and has never had a monopoly. That's a free and open province. Uh, Quebec, for example, you can go to your corner shop and you can buy beer and you can buy any wine that has been bottled in Quebec. So if you bring it in bulk and you bottle it there, you can actually buy that. And generally that's, that's table wine. I'm happy to say in the last five years, since 2015, there has been deregulation in a few provinces. Probably the most significant is Ontario, the most populous one, and licenses to sell both beer and wine have been given to the supermarkets. Supermarkets have really jumped on top of that with respect to beer and craft beer, not so much with wine. So they're, they, they haven't really dipped their toes into any sort of what I call fine wine yet, but, but it'll happen. And, and that deregulation is happening in a couple of different provinces. So it is a changing industry. It is a, it's a significantly changing industry, which I think is great. That being said, wineries are allowed to do direct to consumer, and that's a very popular way to buy your wine. So they are given, um, they're given the ability to have taste rooms and to sell direct to consumers. And they can also sell to restaurants within their local area as well for that. Um, our industry is tiny, so I'll go over that and you can see. So the actual wine industry is pretty small in comparison to other countries. But Canada itself is a really significant uh, market for the wine industry. And we're number six for uh, importing volume and number five for importing value. So we drink wine, we just don't produce a lot of it, put it that way. Uh, Michelle, one, uh, sorry, I keep on interrupting you, but have they been, um, I understand that some of the monopolies have been privatized as well, that, that has some of the monopoly stores, or how does it work? Yeah, so not really privatized. So what they have done, um, so Saskatchewan, for example, uh, voted and uh, they are allowing, uh, not alcohol yet, but they're allowing wine to be sold in stores. And as I said, Ontario, 
supermarkets and be given license to sell wine and okay. sell beer. And that will, that'll be looked at again. And, and that the, the number of supermarkets that are applying for those licenses are increasing and they'll look at it again. It really depends on the local government, what they want to do. Um, it, it's, you know, as you can imagine, it's a cash cow. So controlling it's a cash cow. How they control the sales, they control the prices. However, when you have 600 stores, you're also responsible for rent, for staff, for pensions, mm -hmm. for benefits. And that's a significant. So, you know, it, it plays off with both. So I can see a situation where there will still be some type of government store, but that will be reduced. I think they're going to reduce their footprint in that market, depending on depending on the province. But you can you can see it coming, put it that way. You can see it coming. Mm. All right. Okay, labeling. Uh, so Vendors Quality Alliance, that is the top category. So this is, I guess, equivalent to Appellation Controle or Denominazione Origin Controllata. So it is, uh, it is some type of labeling that we can all look at and we can all make some assumptions. So uh, we have designated viticultural areas uh, and so they're under VQA law. So you can see in this example where they're VQA, this area is uh, Niagara Peninsula, so 100% of the grapes have to come from there, um, or 85, depending on where it is, uh, 95 for BC, 85 for Ontario, uh, and likewise with a vintage or a variety. <clears throat> uh, if it says an estate, this one is particular from an estate, 100% is on that as well. So when we're looking at labeling, it's more for provenance, not dissimilar, you know, very similar to something like uh, California or Australia. So you're looking at having much more label integrity. The laws that go behind that, there is quite a large list of grapes that are allowed. They have minimum, maximum alcohol levels. So there are minimum laws behind it, not as strict as say, you know, Bordeaux with yield or anything like that. But it, it's, it's more to promote quality. It's more to give them sort of the basic premises for quality here. Uh, so that's Fitness Quality Alliance. They use that both in Ontario and British Columbia. The second label that you can have is just a Canadian wine or product of Canada. So you would use this if your wine doesn't meet VQA standards or if your grapes are grown outside of one of these designated viticultural areas. So it has to be 100% Canadian grown grapes, first of all. Uh, that you would put in that. Uh, and then you would have sort of, again, minimum alcohol levels and minimum standards for that, for product of Canada wine. And the last one we have is usually quite fascinating to people and it's what we call international blends. Um, and this is where Canadian grape must is blended with grape must from another country. So we could literally import Malbec must from uh, Argentina bring it into, let's say, Ontario, and then uh, you would uh, blend that with a percentage of Canadian grapes and, and call Malbec. And uh, you would have to state on the label that it's an international blend or international cellar blend. Uh, and you'd have to state it's from both imported and domestic grapes. And it's quite a huge product. 50% um, of Canadian grapes go into this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the only way that, that Canada can produce wines in volume at a lower cost price to compete against, let's say, you know, the, you know, the, the basic high volume branded wines coming from California and Australia. We, our cost of production is just so high that we could never compete in that space. And this is the only way we can do it is, is to actually bring in less expensive grape must from another country. Uh, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty significant uh, as far as wine. So if I had to give you an estimate in, in the country, around 60% of the wine that's purchased is from wine that's imported, let's say from France or from Italy. And out of that 40%, the majority is coming from international, the majority that's purchased of Canadian wines are from international blends and a small percentage is actually just VQA. And that has simply to do with cost and pricing. To be honest. Michelle, so Michelle, did you say that it, it, if it has fifty, it has to have fifty percent, right? So if it's Argentinian Malbec, no, it doesn't, doesn't. I just said fifty percent of all of Canadian grapes. Sorry, go into that. No, I'm going back. Sorry, I'm going back to the labeling. So if it says, uh, if it, let's say they import fifty percent of this bottle is Malbec from Argentina, yeah. and fifty percent is Canadian grapes, right? Yeah, Fast. yeah. 
from yeah. a different variety. So yeah. they can say they can say Malbec on the label, but they no, they can't say Malbec on the label for that. No. Oh, no, all right. All right. Yeah, and, you'd have to say that would be a red blend. Yeah. So let's they, say it was Mer no let's say it was Merlot. From? Yeah. Do you you don't have to say where it's from. from. No. Nope. Okay. All no, right. you just say imported grapes. All right. So you wouldn't know necessarily know what kind of wine you're getting or where is it from. Not necessarily. Oh, no. 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 And this is from a price point of view, as I said, you're you're really competing with, you know, Yellowtail, your big brands, Barefoot, Gallo. That's 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 what this space is for. That's what like this a regional space. blend, equivalent yeah. of a regional blend in Australia, yeah. where you would set red wine, and that's it. Yeah. All right. I mean, the 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 the, the VQA, the highest level VQA label, um, is only ten percent of wine that's purchased. That tends to be quite expensive. I have a question yeah. for you, Michelle. Sure. Um, what? Why is it that the cost of? I know you're going to be talking about this later, but what is this? Yeah. The, there's a question asking why? Why? Why is it that is that the the cost is so high in Canada? Yeah, I know it's look, everywhere in your presentation, but yeah, no, I mean it, it, it is really, really super simple. You know, we're we're not sort of California or Argentina and blessed with great weather. None of our regions are. Um, so you know, we just can't, we just don't produce enough grapes um, with the volume to give you economies of scale to make your production less expensive. We just we just don't. There just isn't that volume out there. And, and there just isn't the weather. We just don't have the climate to do that. So pretty, yeah, pretty simple. So cost production is quite high. You know, depending where you are, it's higher in some places. We were highly taxed. Uh, the land, so in particular, if you look at some of the regions and, uh, you know, we'll talk about Niagara as the last region. You're only 45 minutes drive from Canada. So you kind of, you think about it, it's pretty premium, pretty expensive land. Probably not, you know, it's pretty close to if you're here in the UK and you just go south of London where they produce. You know, that land's pretty expensive. You know, they, they can't produce a lot of wine or a lot of grapes given the climate. So cost of production here is quite high too. So yeah, pretty simple. All right. Okay, so um, so here's a, a map of the US and Canada. So I'm just gonna give, I don't know if people know this, so I'm just gonna give you a couple of basic, basic elements about Canada. Um, so second largest land mass in the world, and we have six time zones. A lot of people don't realize that, but there are six time zones in this country. That's how huge it is. So if I was gonna go, you can see, see where the two latitudes. So what I did is I circled the two latitudes here. So you see the 50th latitude if you're looking at the left, you see the 40th latitude if you're looking at the right. The border between US and Canada is on the 49th latitude, except if you look at where Ontario is, and then it drops down south. So I wanted you to put the latitudes, so you can kind of see, and, we'll, and I'll talk about some comparisons about where we are. But just to give you an idea, if everybody sees where Toronto is in that map, to fly to Toronto to Vancouver, you're talking six and a half hours flight. Three hour time change, six and a half hours. So it's like going from here to Dubai. So that's, you know, we're, we're, we're a big, big place. And I've been up to Salta and I know that's a long flight too, but we're a, this is a big place. So uh, Toronto is a three hour time change from, you know, the Western region. And then you've got the Eastern region and that's another two hour time change. Between the West and the East, there's a five hour time difference, just to let you know. So it's, it, you know, we're talking about, when I talk about these, it's almost talking about three different countries, really. Okay, so taking a look at the parallels, so if you take a look at this map and you can see where Niagara is here, you've got Napa, you've got Yakima and Washington State, you kind of see where the different latitudes are. And you can see how far, particularly Niagara, how far south Niagara is. Niagara sits at 43 degrees latitude. That is further south than the city of Bordeaux. And a lot of people think we're covered in snow, we kind of are, but uh, we're, off, we're pretty far south. So uh, British Columbia, which is on the western side, that's where Oliver is, where you see Oliver. So that's 49. 
uh, latitude. So that's a little bit similar to Frankfurt. Frankfurt's at 50, so slightly further south than Frankfurt, just to sort of give you, give you an idea. Okay. So it just gives us an idea. I'm going to talk about sort of the length of seasons because it, 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 it can kind of show you the different styles of wines that can be produced that are simply due to, you know, when it starts getting cold. So here's a comparison here. I've got latitude, the amount that's planted and the number of wineries. So when we're looking at the far west, which is British Columbia, uh, Okanagan, so the latitude anywhere from, um, it's a very north south region. So we go from 48 uh, in the south up to uh, 51 in the north, 4,100 hectares planted around 224 wineries. Uh, you see Niagara or Ontario, so including Pelee Island, which I'll talk about, that's between 41 and 44 degrees latitude, uh, 6,900 hectares, 183 wineries. There's, there's bigger wineries in Ontario than there are in, in British Columbia, so hence you see uh, less amount. And then Nova Scotia, so the very, very far east, so between 44 and 46 degrees latitude, only 290 hectares at the moment, so it's quite a small area with 20 wineries, but it is one that's, you know, got a really good vibe and it is uh, growing as we speak in their plantings. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the far west first. I'm going to talk about British Columbia. So 1859, uh, as I said earlier, grapes first planted uh, at the Old Latin Missions. So this is what we refer to as First Nations or the uh, Native Canadians that were there. So grapes were first planted there. And these were, we know, Native Canadian grapes. But the very first commercial winery was right after Prohibition, and that was Kelowna Winery in 1931. Not a lot happened between 1931 and 1960. Uh, they were allowed in port you know, in all the provinces, a lot of sort of cheap must and make really, really cheap wine. It, it, wine drinking wasn't terribly popular during that time in the US and Canada. It was a lot of sort of sweeter type of wine. Um, so we really moved forward to the 1960s when they started looking at new areas in British Columbia to do planting. And a lot of these areas were already established as fruit, fruit growing areas. So peach trees, plum trees, cherry trees and they started to plant hybrid vines at that time in the 60s. Vinifera varieties really didn't come into being to the late 70s and early 80s. So that's when a couple of people really decided that they had been to California, we had already had uh, the, the Paris tasting, uh, we're starting to see New, Ze not New Zealand, Australian wine coming on. So they really thought we could do this, we could do this with vinifera varieties and forego the hybrid plants. Um, and in 1994, Mission Hill Winery won Best Chardonnay at the IWSC competition here in London. And that was a really, really, really big deal. It beat out every country for the Best Chardonnay. The other thing I'll say is the wine industry in Canada was greatly affected by the free trade agreement with the US. Until 1988, Canadian wine was protected. And it was just simply protected through taxation, no matter how good it was. There was no incentive for people to make quality Canadian wine. So the minute you took away that, that protection, then the industry started rapidly increasing. And that was in both, in both British Columbia and Ontario. So here's where we are. You can see the larger map in behind out in the west. So we're really in an inland area. We're quite far inland here. And it's, as I said, a very, very north south area. So we're not talking Vancouver. In fact, to get here, you either have to fly directly or you would fly to Vancouver. You, you do not drive. It's, it's about like, it's about going to Cafe Jete. You, it's a long, long time to drive. You're driving through the mountains. So most people do fly. So it's a long north-south uh, region, uh, and it starts in the north on Lake Okanagan, which the area is named after. And on the eastern side of that lake, it's mostly uninhabited, and it's a forest. Uh, there's a little bit in the northeastern part planted, so it's mostly planted on the western side. You have the town of Cologne at the top, and then you've got lovely towns called, believe it or not, Summerland, and there's another town down there called Peachland. Um, so grapes are planted mostly on the western side and around the southern tip of the lake, that's Naramata Bench. As we keep 
keep going down, you've got Saka Lake and Vaso Lake, but then we come down into the, um, into what I call the Southern area, and that's really the Golden Mile and Black Sage Road. And the reason why I bring that up, and then the further Southern region is Usoyus, is because down here is we're getting south, we're getting close to the 49th parallel, and it makes a big, big difference as to what we can, what we can grow here. So our season is extended the further south we are, just simply because of northerly latitude. So let me just show you something that can give you an idea of what the weather's like here. So here we've got uh, Vancouver, which everybody has heard of. It's on the coast. It's a bit like Seattle. It's quite wet. You do get a fair amount of rain and wet from uh, the Pacific Ocean. But the Okanagan is quite a bit inland. And it's a bit like Alsace. So where we have Alsace gives you that protection, that rain shadow. Um, and that's exactly what the Okanagan Valley is. So you are looking at an interior plateau. You've got glacial lakes carved into that. And you've got the Okanagan Range to the west, which really, really protects this area. So although it's an area further uh, north, what it is is extremely dry, very, very continental. Uh, and you have these long days. Not a lot of water, so that's probably the one thing that they actually need to do is they need to uh, irrigate. So from a water point of view, uh, they're a little bit less than normal, around sort of 500. But it really is a beautiful, sunny, dry, dry, dry area <clears throat> for growing. And that's what makes it unique. It is pretty tough. People do it to grow out on the coast. Uh, and it's like Seattle. You know, there is a little bit grown in and around Seattle, but most of it in Washington State is inland. And that's exactly what this is, uh, is inland here. So we've got 224 uh, wineries. We've got nine designated viticultural areas. And as I said, 4,100 hectares. Um, Okanagan Valley is the majority of it. So 95% is produced from the Okanagan Valley. And as I said, quite arid, uh, hot, short, intense growing season. So if I go back to my map, this one here a bit. Um, on Lake Okanagan, on that particular lake, where there's a fair amount of planting, the season relatively finishes in and around mid-September. So here you would have your white grapes. You'd have a lot of Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, and Pinot Noir is quite successful here. Down at the bottom of Lake Okanagan, where you see Penticton is, narrow amount of bench, you can get Merlot ripe here most years, but it's pretty tough to get anything other than Merlot ripe in there. The season just dramatically gets quite cold, and the day is quite short as we get to October. So that's why all the way south here, where it says Golden Mile, Black Sage Road, and even Osoyoos down, Lake Osoyoos, right on the border. If you're going to do any of the cabs, any Sierra, that is exactly where they have to be planted. And even in some years, you know, particularly for Sierra, you can, it can be just slightly, slightly green. You might risk any phenolic ripening. But when you get a good year and a long season, you can get some really beautiful, what I call Croce Hermitage, Saint Joseph, peppery, you know, black and red cherry fruited syrup from here. Likewise, some lovely minty Cab Cabernet Franc can come from here as well. Um, and that, and that, and that's in, and that's in, that's in particularly good years. So it's it's really two halves. If I had to if I had to say, I'd say the north is very Alsatian uh, with Pinot Noir and the grapes, and the south you get into a little bit more sort of um, Bordeaux, a little bit more northern Rome sort of styles. Um, probably the negative parts to it is that sometimes we get alcohol that's too high. Uh, you can really get intense sunny days in it. Drought can be an issue uh, as well. And more recently, forest fires. So forest fires can be an issue with them. But they really don't have any disease pressure, disease problems. It's just a really, you can leave, I say to people, you can leave your pillows outside during the day. Like you just don't, you know, and during the night, you just don't really have an issue. It's a really beautiful, beautiful climate. Michelle, Michelle, you were talking about, sorry, I have a question about the cabinets. Uh, the, are the Cabernet Sauvignons are more like pyrazinic or are they more uh, minty? You were talking about, you know, Yeah, no, it's a really, aspect. it's a really, really, yeah, it's a really, really good question. I would say in the really good years where you actually have lovely weather up until October, mid-October, you can get a real minty. 
when the cold weather, you can have a real cold snap in and around, we call Canadian Thanksgiving, so around sort of October 8th. And if you do get that cold snap, then they're going to be, it's going to be pyrazines. You're going to, you're going to, okay. you're, you're talking leafy bell pepper. So it really depends, depends on the vintage. And, and that, okay. that is the issue that you have, you know, down here, um, uh, down, down here. Like I said, in great years, they're really stunningly beautiful aromatic wines, um, but it, it can have a bit of vintage variation. And how many, how many great years would you say there is in every decade? Is, this, is it more often than not, or is it very variable? You know, I would say your northern, your northern regions, so up near Summerland, um, um, up, up there, for your whites and your pinots, almost every year you have a great year. You really do. Okay. For it is more or less, it's more or less when that ripening season is going to end. I mean, you could have, Marini, you, you know, you could have great weather in September, then all of a sudden a week later you could wake up and it could be sort of three degrees. Right. <coughs> I can change that rapidly. Okay. You know, my, my, uh, a new wine, well, chief winemaker from one of the large companies that operates both in British Columbia and Ontario, he said to me, you know, you know, his, you, know you guys would love this his sales guys were, you know, please plant Malbec, can't you plant Malbec in British Columbia? And he just said, there's absolutely no way. There's just no way we could ever ripen it. You know, like I said, you can ripen Syrah. We are known for beautiful Syrah, but it is going to be red fruit, very, very peppery. And there are years where you just get a slight greenness, which most people are fine with, to be honest. Mm. Uh, so I would yeah, say there's complicated in years. cabinet. Yeah, great years, probably four, four right. out of ten. Okay. You know, slightly marginal, you know, probably another three, four. You know, there, you know, I'd say I would say two to three a decade, not great years. Okay. And is warming it's it's climate warming helping? It is. Yeah. I think climate change is is, is in interesting because I think it's doing two things to the Okanagan. It, it is the the, the sun levels are too high so you guys know this with you know sunburn so that is one thing for the northern regions where they have to look at their training and trellising a little bit more carefully because of sunburn it's certainly helping the southern areas the soy's black sage road it's certainly helping with them although you do get in those really hot years you do get sort of huge alcohols mm. so you know that that's uh, you know you, yes you can ripen grapes but then you've got long days um, that are quite dry and you can get up to over 14% of them. So it, it's, it's it, a it is huge 14, would you mean? Yeah, 14% 14 14 14 or 15? 14, right. 14 and a half. Yeah. So huge by Canadian standards, you not can. huge yeah, by for us. Argentinian yeah, Not for you, but for us it is. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, good. Good to clarify that one. Yeah, I think just, just as, a, and I'll talk about this when I talk about the producers, where you see your soyuz down there and Lake Soyuz, just because I think it's really, really unique. That is, that land is owned by First Nations. So that is First Nations land and people with wineries actually rent the land from First Nations. So, um, um, and there's a very, very successful First Nations winery there, which I think is a really lovely story. So anyway, okay, there we go. It is that beautiful though. Uh, just to give you an idea how long the lake is, the lake is around 200 kilometers. So if you look at the largest lake, Lake Okanagan, it's around 200 kilometers. So, you know, about two, two and a half, about three hours to drive right down there, three and a half, just to kind of give you an idea of, of, uh, of distance for driving. I was reading that there, there are more than three million lakes in Canada. Mm -hmm. But that there are like 500 and more than 560 lakes that are greater than 100 square kilometers. That's yeah. massive. Yeah, yeah. And all the regions are beside lakes, correct? Yeah, they are. There are. And, and, and there are. For, for this particular region, it is to get that light reflection, to get the warmth, to make sure it's just warmer in the spring and warmer, you know, to extend that season out in the wintertime. It doesn't really give too much humidity here. It's really, really quite dry. So they're very, very lucky with the lack of disease pressure. Mm. Very unique, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, the other thing is right down at the bottom, right on the border with uh, inner soy use, that is classified as a desert. So that's part of the Sonoran Desert, which uh, Washington oh. State shares. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. Okay, um, some really notable produce. Pre 
producers. Uh, we have three really quite significant producers that operate in both Ontario and British Columbia. Uh, Peller State, Okanagan. So it'd be Peller State, Ontario or Peller State, Okanagan. Um, so they're pretty significant, high quality wines. We do tend to see them on the export market. So you might actually see them in South America. Inniskillen, and I'll talk about Inniskillen when we, when we get to Ontario. So it's got really historic significance, but they also operate in the Okanagan again, and Jackson Triggs does. So those are three that operate both in Ontario and are quite well, they got really good reputations. Uh, they do have size, so you do actually see them on the export market a fair amount. Uh, something that's totally um, Okanagan is Mission Hill Family Estate. So this is the one that won the Chardonnay Award in 94. And then you've got sort of lots and lots of small ones. So as we go down to what I call that Black Sage Road, you've got Burring Owl, which really has, and they if they really are, by the way, Burring Owls on the property. So they have little boxes for them. Quail's Gate, Painted Rock. Uh, I know you can get Painted Rock here in the UK. In Kameep, so In Kameep is the First Nations owned uh, winery from Isoyus. Um, <clears throat> La Vieux Pain uh, is here, Tantalus Vineyards. So a lot of these, uh, these ones in the bottom are much more sort of boutique. So you, it would be if you had a specific importer uh, that was bringing in sort of these small production because there's a lot of, lot of very, very, very small production here. Is the owl, ones. does the owl in, in the burrowing owls have any, any um, job or is it just that they like owls or do they work? No, it's, 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 it's an area that actually has burrowing owls are protected. Okay. So they actually have owl boxes for them. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, and they're and because they they do burrows, they give them boxes they can burrow on the estate. So it's actually quite lovely. You can go around and you can actually very very sustainable. You can go around and you can look at these owl boxes. So it's a very specific owl to that part of yeah that part right. of the country. Okay. Yeah, little tiny ones. They're little tiny owls. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to uh, zip across uh, and uh, get in the plane and go about, well, I guess we're going about seven hours, five hours time chain, five hours difference to get to Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia, although it's, um, uh, as I said, 1611, that they had some plantings. It's, I think for today, it's a little bit more recent. So 1859, Annapolis Valley grapes were planted uh, and nothing really happened after that, after prohibition. Um, until about the 1970s, but 1978 to be exact. So hybrids were planted in the late 70s and they continue to be planted with some vinifera today. This is one of the areas that is growing in its plantings where both the Okanagan and Ontario are sort of settled and they're, they're, not, they're not growing a huge amount as far as plantings, but Nova Scotia is. Uh, their big uh, was in 2000, Joss Winery won a nice wine competition at a Canadian Wine uh, Award show, so that was a really big deal for them. And you know, a lot of Canadian producers had to sit up and take notice. So they formed their own winery association in 2003. They don't use VQA at the moment. What they did instead is they created their own label called Tidal Bay. So 2011, uh, Tidal Bay first came out in the market, it was created in 2010. You see a picture of one there. And what they want Tidal Bay to be is a wine that represents Nova Scotia. So there's around 20 different grapes that can be blended into it. Um, it's got to have a certain amount of acidity. It can have a bit of residual sugar, um, but they want it to just to be fresh, acidic, uh, flavorful, early drinking. And they think that's what represents Nova Scotia. So here we are here. So we are way, way out in the Atlantic. And this is a difficult place to grow grapes. So although latitude, it's around sort of 44, you just have so many different influences being in the Atlantic here. And that really affects their season. So their degree growing days are, um, are on the marginal side of being able to grow grapes. So they're, they're there are far less um, days in the growing season than places like the Moselle. So it is very similar to the amount of days we have here in the UK to produce grapes. So those two are very similar. And weather-wise, they're quite similar as well. Um, one thing that makes, uh, that keeps this area a little bit warmer and a little bit, <clears throat> uh, uh, prolongs the season a bit, is the Bay of Fundy. So I circled the Bay of Fundy there. This is 
uh, one of the biggest, most influential. It's got some of the biggest tides in the world, and it just keeps this constant air movement, which is really, really needed in this area. It's needed for two things. It's needed because it's damp and it's humid, but it's also needed in the winter time because this is an area where you can get really, really, really deep frost. So all the wine regions are really, you can see they're nestled in, they're tucked around somewhere to kind of give them a bit of protection. Um, but they are in the marginal areas of growing. So, you know, they need to have their grapes right by the beginning of September because it just gets like here in this country, it just, you know, you're not quite sure whether what you're going to get in September. So it can get very, very rainy. It can affect ripening. So they tend to plant um, uh, grapes that will suit that. And that's generally white for the majority white because of the humidity, because of the dampness hybrids are still very, very popular to be grown there. They're playing around with Riesling and Chardonnay, but it's mostly about hybrids just because they've got thicker skin and they're hardier in the winter time. Um, so only 20 wineries at the moment, less than 300 hectares. Um, you can see there's Riesling there. So you've got things like Cebu Blanc, Marichal Foch, Ortega, uh, Lacadie Blanc, um, so a bunch of different grapes that you might not have heard of, but again, uh, very, very, very suited to the weather there, very much suited to the weather. Uh, they're mostly white, something like 95% of what they produce is white. It is really difficult to ripen any red. A bit of Pinot Noir, Marichal Foch is actually red. It's got pretty thick skins. It's another hybrid. Um, and what they're really excelling in, other than this really fresh, crisp white, is sparkling wine. So that's something that they've really taken on board. And again, I say to people, it's very similar here to the UK, if you have sparkling wines in the UK. Some of it's traditional methods, some of it isn't, um, but they, you know, they just have the, the right amount of acidity, they have sort of the right style in their base wines to produce sparkling wines. And they're, you know, a couple of producers are really gaining a great reputation for their sparkling wines. So really that's kind of what they're known for, just really fresh, crisp white and sparkling wines. Which um, varieties they use, Michelle, for sparkling? Yeah, it depends. So there's some of them use Riesling, uh, some of them use blends. So Riesling, Silver Blanc, and maybe some Chardonnay. Uh, some of them are trying Chardonnay. Only. So it, I think you various different things. For so the they sparkling. make method traditional with Riesling? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing that, that, that really they do well, this is a really, not this year, but it normally, you know, Nova Scotia is a very, very tourist and visited area. So they do get a lot of tourism. Uh, they do have a lot of events. They do have a lot of cellar door. British Columbia is a bit more isolated. So they're hard. They've got good cellar doors and restaurants, but it's harder to get to the British Columbia area where a lot of people can go to Halifax here. It's not too far from the UK to get there. It's not too far from the US at all. And it's, it's considered to be a very attractive place to drive around and visit. And so they do quite well with uh, direct to consumer uh, and with cellar door events in Nova Scotia, which I think really helps the reputation. So notable producers, so I would probably all of this, Domaine de Grand Prix, they were the very first ones that, that were in the modern planting in 1979. So they, they've got the most well-known name. Um, but I think Benjamin Bridge right now is probably the one that there's a lot of wine writers have written about and exported, and you do tend to find that more or less more um, um, on the export market. A little bit of Jost as well, you might find more in the export market. Okay. So finally, we're in Ontario. So not too far away from Nova Scotia, but it is still a two hour time change. And it's still about a two and a half, almost three hour flight uh, away. And we are looking at the Great Lakes. So you see it here. And uh, as you really look at this, you can see how close the border is, but also how far south this area is. So as I said, Toronto is the, um, uh, is the largest city in Canada. Uh, with the largest population. Uh, it sits at 43.6 latitudes, so it's quite far south. But you can see around Lake Ontario, so around the bottom of it, that's where Niagara region is. So Niagara region actually sits at uh, 43. But further to that, even further south, if you look at the other big lake, which is Lake Erie, you actually see another wine region there. And, uh, and then there's a little tiny blop in the middle of Lake Erie, which is called Pelee Island. 
And the reason why I mentioned Pelee Island, because first of all, it latitudinally is actually uh, very similar to where Rome sits latitudinally. So I'm not quite sure whether people, people know that or not, um, but it, it, it sits at around sort of 40 latitudinally and, uh, and, that's, where, and that's where Rome sits. Um, so it's actually, quite, um, it's actually quite far south. Uh, one of the things with this particular region and both of the regions, um, Pelee Island uh, and on Lake Erie and Niagara are these lakes. So this is what we have five great lakes. You can see three of them on the map and they are, they are the world's fifth largest supply of fresh water. That's the first thing. They are extraordinarily huge. So the circumference of Lake Ontario is a thousand kilometers to go around it. So it is an enormous lake and it's incredibly deep. It's 250 meters deep and it does not freeze over. So these lakes themselves act as oceans. So, so to talk about a lake, they really are oceanic influences to it. So, you know, like sitting beside the Atlantic or like sitting beside the Pacific. So really, really influential from a weather pattern and weather point of view. Um, and that really is what defines both of these regions, both of those two particular lakes. These ones don't freeze, right? No, so Ontario doesn't freeze. Lake Erie is not as deep. So Lake Erie is around 60 meters deep. So part of Lake okay. Erie will freeze, but Lake Ontario doesn't freeze. And Lake Ontario is so rough. You know, you kind of look at this and you think, oh, I should be able to take a nice ferry from Toronto just straight across, but you can't because it's too rough. So if you're going to boat, and lots of people do boat, you boat inside what we call the break wall because you go outside of it and you can be really caught really, really, really rough. It's that deep you can bring tankers down. So they'll bring tankers down from Montreal through the, uh, the river, the St. Lawrence River system, and they can bring tankers into Lake Ontario for that deep. It's just a massive, massive lake. It's just huge. And I'll, I'll, I'll go over it. I'll put, I'll put the map up again and I'll talk how it influences the weather. So as I said, 1811, uh, grapes were first planted. And Pelee Island, this is interesting, people came up from Kentucky in 1866, believe it or not, to plant in Pelee Island. Now, you'll ask why would they came up, come up from southern US? And Pelee Island is famous because that's where Al Capone used to um, hide the alcohol. He would buy it in Canada because we could produce it in Prohibition and he would cross it over the over uh, Lake Erie because it was the it less deep and you could actually cross Lake Erie and he would stop in Pelee Island and he would actually hide his alcohol. So that's why people in Kentucky in the 1860s knew about Pelee Island. So they actually brought up their own grapes, they brought up native grapes and they planted it in Pelee Island. Today Pelee Island is a designated viticultural area. There is only one winery on it. Um, and and, it, and it, it has planted with vinifera and some hybrid grapes even today. It's not inhabited. It's a it's a it's an echo for, it's a habitat. It's a nature it's a nature habitat that you go visit with the winery on it. Uh, 1952, we had a couple big companies that that tried vinifera unsuccessfully and planted hybrids. And I said that was in that time where they were producing really cheap sweet wine for the population. The really big deal and the big change was in 1975. So the very first winery license that was granted since prohibition was granted in 1975 to Inniskillen. And that's why Inniskillen is so important in the modern history of, uh, of Canadian wine. And their whole goal, Don Kaiser, um, Carl Kaiser and Don Zeraldo, was to make quality wine, to use vinifera only. And Don Zeraldo's uh, family were in the fruit growing business there. And Carl Kaiser came from Austria and uh, he knew about winemaking. So that's how they paired up. So they just absolutely only wanted to produce. So Don Zeraldo convinced his father and a couple of his friends to plant vinifera. And so vinifera grapes were replanted. And I think that's where you've got the modern, um, modern area of, of, of Ontario wines, to be honest. VQA was established after that. So during the 80s, you had quite a few people um, opening up wineries. So things like Cave Springs, Color Estate, um, Chateau de Charme, uh, Pelletary, so a couple names people might recognize, you might see those on the export market. So they all started really in the 80s. So VQA, they all got together and they created them themselves and then, and then that, that then became law. 
And in 1991, in the Skill and Ice Wine, won the Prix d'Honneur at the Expo. So that was a pretty, that was a pretty good deal. So I put this in there just to give you a little bit of fun. So this is, uh, everybody recognize that? That is Niagara Falls. So Niagara Falls rarely freezes. So that's a very unusual historic perspective of Niagara Falls. So why do we have Niagara Falls? What is it about this region? Niagara Falls is not right there. Anybody's been there. You have to drive about 25 minutes to get to the falls. But I bring this up because it is quite unique. So what we actually have here is something called an escarpment. So where I've circled Niagara Escarpment, Niagara on the lake, in between these two lakes, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, there is an escarpment, about a 300 meter ridge that, that goes east to west. So if you think of it, it forms the back of Niagara. So the front of it would be plantings and the lake, and the back of it is this escarpment, is this ridge. And that creates a very lovely effect with the lake. You know, it circulates air, it circulates sun, and, and we truly call this our banana belt. Like this is where, you know, peaches are grown and, and cherries are grown, and this is where it's only, it's only 45 minutes away in Toronto, you go there this time of year and you buy all that sort of soft fruit and soft food, in, in, including grapes, to be honest. But that escarpment, that difference in land, that escarpment between 300 meters drops off on Niagara Lake and that fall, and that, that formulates the falls. So the falls here are only about uh, 25 minutes, 25 minutes away from Niagara Peninsula. So you can see where the three areas are. We have the newest area, which is actually on the north side of Lake Ontario called Prince Edward County. And there is one or two producers on the export market. It's a lovely place to visit, but gosh, it's a really tough place to grow grapes. They're just, we would call this the wrong side of the lake. You know, they just get the wrong part of what we call lake effect. They get the snow, they get the wind, they get the rain. Um, they get it much more than Niagara is. So uh, it's a lovely area and they, uh, they sometimes even have to bury vines. So it's, uh, it, it sounds bizarre, but there, it's just that that's how dominant that sort of lake can be. So this is what I was talking about. There's Niagara Escarpment. Um, like I said, uh, around sort of 300 meters. No one's really planted at that 300 meter, but what you just get is this lovely airflow pattern. The original plantings were in where A was. We call that the beach. And then people expanded a little bit up into B. And now there's a lot of really nice plantings in C and D. We call those the benches. And, and there's some, um, some really nice plantings of Chardonnay and Pinot in particular in the CMD area. How do you call CMD, Michelle? I didn't get it. We call them bench. Bench. Bench? Yeah, a bench. So like stairs. If you think of it like stairs, we call that a bench. So we take that name. I think we stole it from, the, um, from uh, those, in the, those in California. They call them benches as well. Oh. So that's what we've got I, a couple. Can... Sorry. No, no, go on, go on, sorry, it's me. Well, we've got a couple of wineries that have it in their name. So Hidden Bench, 30 Bench. All right. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I, I do. I, I it... wanted to ask you about this lake effect because it's such, such a unique combination of what happens between water and winds that affects yeah. basically all seasons, right? Yeah. That make that region possible the way it is. So could you very quickly tell us what, what happens? What, what is the effect of that mass of water and the winds and how does that change and allows them to produce the ones they do. Yeah, no, and this is simply because we're at 43 degrees latitude. So when you are in Toronto, if anybody's been in Toronto in their summertime, they may have relatives that live there. This is a very hot, hot place. So you get up in the morning in July or August and they'll give you a temperature and they'll say it's 25 degrees Celsius, but with the humidity, it feels like 38. So this is, uh, we have quite long um, summer seasons. We have, you know, we do have cold winters, but very long, very sunny. You know, it can be chilly up until almost mid-April and then all of a sudden the next day, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be 30 degrees Celsius. So it might be 16 one day and 30 degrees Celsius the next day. So the change can be that dramatic. So you do have this, this element where the lake does, the lake closer to the shore, because it doesn't freeze over, heats up and it stays warm and it just that 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 air that warmth air helps in the winter time but equally we've got a bit of coolness that can help in the summertime 
Uh, there is reflection of light, which is greatly helpful as well. Um, we do have humidity, and that's probably the biggest difference between other than latitude and length of seasons. The bigger difference here is it is humid. You just don't go, well, it's a bit like Buenos Aires, right? You just don't go many places with air conditioning in the summertime. It can be that, that humid. So um, spraying is, is, is a natural part of life there. Um, you know, training and trellising is, is an issue there as well. But as, as you said, Marina, it is this, because we have this incredible deep, almost ocean-like element, it really keeps this area much more moderate and much warmer all throughout the season, including the winter time, which is why the grapes, you know, don't, we don't, you don't really have a deep, deep, deep freeze in, in Niagara. You may have in other areas, so if I go back, you can have a deep freeze uh, up where Prince Edward County is because they don't have that same protection, but you will not have the same deep freeze on the Niagara Lake, not, not even remotely because of that. And that is all to do with where the lake is in the area. Cool, thank you. So this map here shows you a little bit and the boundary of it, it really is the escarpment. So when we take a look at this, you see Niagara Peninsula and you see it sort of comes to a point. That is the escarpment that backs it and the area and the, and the growing area is all in front. You now can see where Niagara Falls is. So it's not right there, Niagara Falls. You do have to drive there uh, to go see it, but it's, it's, it's super close. It, it really is uh, very, very close. So as I said, you can, um, the bottom little inset map shows where Toronto is and you just drive around the lake. It's about a 45 minute, 50 minute drive with no traffic. We have horrible traffic, but with no traffic, it's very, very close uh, to the main city, um, which is helpful. You know, this is a very visited touristy area. Tasting rooms are the norm. Um, direct to consumer is a very popular way. Uh, many of them don't need to retail through the government monopoly at all. Uh, in addition to that, Niagara the Lake, so right at the very end at the top, you can see a little thing right there, Niagara the Lake, is a very, very visited, visited town. So it's a very fashionable town to go to. There's a lot of theater. And then if you go down south, you've got Niagara Falls. And Niagara Falls is the most visited tourist attraction on the whole of the northeast of the U.S. and Canada. So they get over a million, normally they would get over a million people a year. So it's a very popular, popular area for people to visit and even do day trips in. Um, I think which, which really helps the reputation, really helps. There's a lot of experience there that people can come and visit and go out for the day and experience it. Um, and, and a lot of locals now buy more Canadian wine than they used to, I think, because of that. So you can see the two main districts here. We have the escarpment, so the ridge, the escarpment, and then we have the, we have the area in around Niagara and the lake, which is the, which is the original area, the flat area where they planted. Uh, and then you've got popular subregions. There's about 10 subregions. So here you've got Beansville Bench, 20 Mile Bench, Short Hill Bench. And those are areas that all indicate that they, 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 they're planting up in the escarpment. As far as grapes, simply because uh, we have a long season and they, they can grow successfully, the two caps. They can grow Merlot successfully, they can grow Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc successfully, but they also grow Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, obviously, Chardonnay, Riesling. If I had to pick two, I would say from a white point of view, Riesling has been there since the 1980s. They now have over 30 year old Riesling. It's probably one of the best things that they absolutely do. They have stunning, stunning Riesling. Very, um, I don't want to say, I, they're much more Rheingau. If I had to say a Rheingau Faltz, there's just a little bit more breadth and weight in them. So it's not really Moselle at all. There's just, there's more heat there. There's more ripeness uh, in it. At times in a hot year, they can be even Alsatian style, very dry Riesling, although it's quite popular to leave a little bit of RS, so that's why I like to compare it a bit to Germany. Uh, from a Chardonnay point of view, we've really got some top Chardonnay um, that a lot of wine writers have written about. Very Burgundian, I would say more Southern Burgundy. There's a lot of barrel fermentation here. We can get good 13, 13 and a half percent, so very similar to, to you know, any anywhere, anywhere from if you were going to go down 
you know, it's not quite Marceau, but it's it, it's sort of in between the Marceau Puy, Puy Fusay sort of style uh, very much. And that's one of the premium products that they produce. From a black point of view, um, for me, it's always been Cabernet Franc. It, again, Cabernet Franc plantings have been there, you know, for about 30 years. They do do Cabernet Sauvignon. I think the best Cabernet Sauvignon is one that's blended with a bit of Cabernet Franc, but they do a lot of single varietal Cabernet Franc. And they were doing, they've been doing this for years before it was fashionable. And it's really, really gorgeous. If I had to compare it, it's a lot more ripeness and richness and alcohol than the Loire. Um, um, and there are some really similarities to some of the Cabernet Francs that you guys are producing in the Uco uh, of the high altitude. You get some very similar, not pyrazini, but very lovely, you know, her purple, minty, with fresh acid, and you just get this lovely sort of black and red fruit ripeness. Uh, and that's just one, I'm glad to see Cabernet Franc is fashionable because it's one thing that they do really, really, really well. I think Merlot has always been there because the population likes Merlot, but you know, one thing, I, I, if I had to pick up one thing, it would be Cabernet Franc that I think they excel. They do Pinot Noir, don't get me wrong, they do beautiful Pinot Noir as well. But for me, it's about, for me, it's about Cabernet Franc, obviously you know, if I had to pick sort of two. Uh, as I said, quite a long growing season. If I had to compare the growing season, if I look at degree days, they actually have similar degree days to Bordeaux. Um, so they're right sort of in that zone two of degree days um, uh, where they do have this nice, nice long, long growing season. Generally, they can ripen things up until mid-October without a problem. Um, what was I going to say? It, it remains relatively dry during the autumn, September, October. Most years is nice, dry. Um, we get these lovely sort of, um, you know, autumn, sunny, sunny autumns, um, which can help. They can help for late harvest stocks. We do, other than nice one, we do sort of late harvest style as well. Uh, we don't really risk a lot of rain. We don't risk a lot of rain during summer, nor do we risk it in the autumn. We get our water um, really from snow melt in um, in the winter time. That's really where we get it. We might get it a bit in the spring, but for the most part, it's 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 about getting it uh, getting it through the snow melt. Uh, and as I said, their biggest issue really is rot. It's really managing managing rot. And the pictures here, you can see that's on the Niagara River. So this is actually um, Niagara on the Lake. There's a picture, and the bottom is an aerial shot of Peavey Island, which I thought was was kind of cool in the middle of Lake Erie. So Michelle, how would you uh, compare the Chardonnay? You said you compared it to Burgundy, but how you can you would compare it to the northern part of the Okanagan uh, Valley? Yeah, it, no, it's a really, really good question. I, I think the difference is if, it, if it's from the northern part, the northern part of the Okanagan is a bit more, the alcohols may only get to about 12 there. It's a little bit leaner stylistically. Um, I don't, it's not as lean as Chablis. It's a little bit riper than Chablis. Uh, and here we're going to get nice, much, much greater ripening. So much greater okay. to you know, the, the, the Cote de Bonne, you know, and in some hot years even further. But it depends. You know, look, if you've got Chardonnay from the southern part of the Okanagan, you can actually get some Puy Fuisse as well, sort of type of ripening. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So notable producers and some of these you may have seen on the export market or in tasting. Again, you've got Peller State in the Skill and Jackson Triggs and certainly, and I'm going to talk about ice wine from an ice wine point of view, uh, those are the three producers you would see in the export market. But from some of what I call the, the, the smaller, more boutique, uh, who are um, two of them in particular, their, their names are known a little bit more. One of them is Taus. And Murray Taus is actually bought in Burgundy. So you actually get Domaine Taus in Burgundy. Uh, and it's, it's a, quite a high reputation. He's a very wealthy man. And uh, he bought in Burgundy and has spent a lot of money there. Um, but he started first in Niagara. So uh, you might want to take a look at some wine lists and see if you can find some uh, Domaine Taus in Burgundy. So he produces here Chardonnay and Pinot. That, that's what he loves and that's what he produces here. Uh, and he is in the bench area. Uh, 30 Bench, uh, they're known for their Rieslings. They have very old planted Rieslings and they just, they win every award internationally around the world for their Rieslings. So you might see them occasionally, uh, as well as Cape Springs. And Bachelor, uh, Thomas Bachelor also uh, makes wine in Burgundy. 
So, and he's another one that is on his Canadian wines uh, are on actually the export market as well, but also, you know, he is a winemaker and has a really high reputation in Burgundy. Norman Hardy, Norman Hardy is from the newer area of Prince Edward County. So he's actually worked really hard to get his wine on the export market. So you can actually get it uh, a few places as well. So, um, you know, lots of, lo lots of different, lots of different wineries here, but I think some of them you'll recognize um, at least some of the names that may be through the ice wine. And speaking of, there it is. So ice wine, Canada is the largest producer of ice wine in the world. Uh, majority of it does come out of Ontario. So 90% uh, of the ice wine that's produced is out of Ontario. And and that's just, you know, that, that's where it was first done. That was, that's where it was first set up. They've got a couple larger wineries uh, that do do it. So for ice wine, we do have pretty strict laws. And the first one is that it must be at least minus eight degrees Celsius. And they do have authorities going around when it's minus eight degrees Celsius. And uh, what happens is the, the, the basket, the presses come out. So they come outside, so they, you know, lift up the door, presses come outside. Uh, the grapes do come in, so the grapes are harvested at night. So as soon as it goes down, um, uh, if they think the grapes are ready, they'll go out and they'll harvest them. Depending on your vineyard, you'll hand pick it. What a delightful job at night, minus eight. Um, but uh, uh, you can machine harvest it. You know, these are little marbles. So they're, they're by the way, they have to be netted. Um, if you've ever seen sort of birds in December in the freezing cold, they're just starving and desperate. So they are always netted. But you can get a machine out there whacking around the nets and whacking around these little marbles. So you, you, it's, it's very romantic to think they're all picked by hand, but you know, you can get out there and you can hand harvest them. So the grapes come in, so you can actually see that. So they're little marbles. They're quite desiccated. They're quite, um, they've been having a long hang time. So ideally, we would like to pick this if, you know, Mother Nature cooperates, we would love to pick this in December. You know, um, it, that doesn't always happen these days. We don't get that cold temperature in December. But if we do, it's a great year. There's a lot of volume here. So if you're thinking, you know, you have to think that the grapes are hanging on the vine until then. And if we don't get that cold in December, then we're waiting till January, February. So by that time, they're pretty, they're pretty raised up. You know, we're not, we want healthy grapes. We don't want rot. We don't want botrytis. So they will constantly go through the vineyards and make sure all the rotted grapes are out. The absolute worst year for ice wine is when we have what I call an English Christmas. So in other words, if Christmas day is, you know, five degrees Celsius and it's rainy and it's misty, that is the worst, worst news for any, anybody who's making ice wine. You just do not want it to warm up. You just do, you don't want it. Um, the grapes will start dripping as opposed to freezing. It's just the worst, worst weather. So you want it to be nice and dry. You want a really good, hard, hard, cold to hit. And they may even wait a bit. They may let it hit cold and then let it warm up. And they may wait a week of this kind of, you know, cold warm up, cold warm up, cold warm up. So they may even do that. The first grapes that are harvested will always be Riesling. That's their premium grape. Riesling is not as hardy. The skins are pretty thin, so they can get Riesling off the vine first. That's what they'll do. You can see with the press, that's the press cake. So there just isn't a lot of juice here. And, and you know, the pressing, you're pressing marbles. That's essentially what you're doing. I mean, these are ice. And it works because the juice isn't frozen. So you're just getting this really, really, really thick, sugary, sugary must and very, very slowly, like hours overnight. And you've got to press and come back and press again and come back. And they might even chop that up a bit. So you can just sort of see that's waste that you just don't get a heck of a lot of juice coming out of this. You get on average, depending on the grape, you get around three to three and a half kilos of uh, frozen grapes to make a half a bottle. So if you kind of think one kilo for one bottle, it's, that's, uh, it's not a lot. It's really not a lot. So uh, once they do get the juice, uh, they will ferment and they have to be inoculated. There's just too much sugar here. So, you know, really specific yeast. Uh, they might have to even restart, depending on the sugar, they might even have to restart it a few times. 
Um, Carl Kaiser, before he retired, he's now passed away, he, believe it or not, created a sparkling ice wine under a uh, Sharma, under the tank method. So that was quite extraordinary to have a tank and to actually have yeast who could actually do a second fermentation. So that was, you know, that was, or do one long fermentation is actually what he did. So that was quite extraordinary. But for the most part, you're just sort of doing normal fermentation with, uh, with added yeast. Sugar levels will be anywhere between 150 and about 250, depending on um, depending on what they are when they're picked, depending on when the uh, when the uh, when the wine stops fermenting. Popular grapes, there's no doubt Vidal is the most popular. That's Vidal hanging on the vine there. It is a hybrid. Um, the vinifera parent is uh, Trebbiano, and that is a cross with some odd grape called Rayon d'Or. And believe it or not, that was created in France for a cognac region. Uh, and why they like it, it's thick skins. So it's pretty neutral, but it has high acid and it has super, super thick skins. So it really survives and it freezes quite well. Uh, the most premium product, as I said, is Riesling. And the other thing they do is Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc, nice thick skins, got the acidity and look at it, it looks pretty. So it's got good enough color that there's color stability. They, they do do a Pinot Noir, but there's it's just very little color left. So it looks like a Van Gris, it looks like almost like a gray, like these pale roses. So Cabernet Franc is, 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 is the most um, popular of the black grapes that they'll do. And again, they'll do, uh, those that are brave enough will, uh, will, do a, will do a sparkling one as well. And these are not terribly uh, cheap. They're pretty expensive products to make. They're pretty expensive wines. Um, they don't use oak, although there is a few producers that will do an oak aged Vidal, but it's generally not common. And if I had to compare an ice wine for those that, ha that, that have never had it, you're getting what I call, you know, if you think about a Riesling, you're getting that pure lemon taste, just super, super concentrated. So for me, having a Riesling ice wine is like having pure lemon curd. There's no other sort of botrytis flavor. It's just the absolute purity of that grape. Vidal turns out to me a lot more sort of like a bit like papaya, a bit like mango and papaya, but Riesling is just absolutely super concentrated lemon curd for me. Just, you know, lemon custard is what it is. And Cabernet Franc actually tastes like Cabernet Franc. There's a bit of slightly pyrazine slightly leafy, you know, red fruit from Cabernet Franc. Some people don't like it, some people love it. But it is, it's all about the purity of that grape. That's what you're really looking for. It's a difference between ice wine and anything with the trays when you do make it. Well, that's about it. Michelle, I have, no, I have a question for you about apple ice wine. Yes, apple mm -hmm. cider. Yeah, apple cider apple. ice wine. Apple cider yeah. ice wine. And how does that impact on the sales of positioning? Um, yeah, of yeah, interesting. So that's made in Quebec. Um, and um, how they make it is they do a couple things. They can leave the apples on the vines or they pick the apples and they completely, they immediately press it and they'll press it to me. So most common thing is that they'll pick it in September and they'll press them and they'll get the juice out. And then when it gets cold, they'll put the juice out to freeze. So they don't do cryo extraction. They're not freezing it artificially. They'll actually put this juice that they've held. So they'll actually put apple juice and they'll put it out and they'll put it out to get a freeze. Um, uh, that way they can get the volume. They actually say they think the flavor is better that way than letting the apples sort of hang around on the vine. In particular, they like it better because apples are, well, they're really prone to rot. Anywhere about 60 to 80 apples will make a half a bottle. So you need a heck of a lot of apples to make this. And it's very specific to, you know, making Calvados or making apple brandy. You know, your different types of apples, anybody who's into cider, um, really make different flavors. It depends on your different acidity levels and they really make sort of uh, different flavors. Some of sort of the best producers in Quebec will do, will do a blend. They'll do a couple of different apples and they'll do a blend. But once they get this juice, it's no different. They'll just ferment it. They'll ferment it in the tank. Uh, and then the fermentation is stopped a little bit lower alcohol level. Uh, but but that's, it's, 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 it's not dissimilar. It's not made in nearly the volumes of ice wine. So they're just isn't a lot of it around and it there, there isn't an overall huge producer of it either it's still very much uh, an artesian 
product in Quebec. So it is still very much sort of a, a niche level. Some of them will put in oak. It's a little bit more common to have ice cider or even cider actually in wood than it is, uh, than it is ice wine. Um, as far as laws, it's, it's, I believe it's around 130 uh, minimum uh, residual sugar that it has to be, uh, and minimum sort of seven, eight degrees uh, alcohol for, for cider. But it is, you know, it's a really, it's a really cool product, actually. It's a really unique and very, very different flavor, but it is, it's still pretty small. It's still pretty niche and it's still, it's still pretty small in comparison to ice wine. Yeah. I'm not sure if I asked the question correctly. I don't know who asked that question, but um, I hope that has answered your question. If not, can you tell Monica? Yeah, I mean, I think the other part, it was positioning it. Uh, yeah. It is sold mostly, you know, there are one or two produ producers that uh, will appear and will, you know, will, um, you know, will look to be picked up on the export market. But a lot of it, um, it's a specialty at Christmas. So we in Ontario, maybe we'll get a little okay. bit to be sold at Christmas. Uh, but it's sold through the LCBO and it's sold through the SAQ. It has to be sold through those two stores or it's sold at their cellar door. So for the most part, you'll see it um, at a certain time of year. We This time of year at Christmas, there isn't a lot of it. Um, or you'll actually see it, particularly in Montreal or Quebec City. Uh, you'll see it, you'll see it by the class. What, what do they eat in, in Christmas in, in, in Canada, Michelle? Uh, depends where you're from. <laughs> well, I know you have we six are, time differences and everything, but yeah, no, no, it depends with this, with this apple cider. <laughs> oh gosh, I'd have apple pie with that. There'd be no, there'd be, there'd be very, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd make an apple pie. Are you kidding me? I'd have an apple pie with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. like when you ask the Australians about sparkling Shiraz for Christmas, isn't it? It's one of those specialty yeah. products that they, they have it with turkey and it's, um, no, it's, it's very local. Tradition. Yeah, no. I wouldn't say we're I wouldn't say we're quite that, but look, Canadians will have anything from it depends depends where you're from, depends what your background. You know, anything from Turkey, you know, my background's Italian. We don't have turkey at Christmas, we have pasta at Christmas, so we have pasta and we have beef. So um, you know, so we've we've read and wine from lots of different places at Christmas time. But I think it really, it kind of, it kind of depends where you're from. Quebec, they'll do tortier, which is a meat pie. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll have that at Christmas time and a bit of turkey at Christmas time. So apple cider, they'll also do a bit of apple cider. It, it's not usually out. Cider's out, but not ice cider. Cider is out okay. for uh, Canadian Thanksgiving, which is early October. So they'll do that with pumpkin okay. pie. That's regular cider. Yeah. Apple pie. Cool. <laughs> Well, Michelle, thank you. Uh, I think, oh, yes, I have another question, the last one. Um, and the question is if Cabernet Franc is trendy. I guess that would be in, in Canada, the question? If it's trendy in Canada? I mean, I can talk about it in Canada, out of Canada. Look at, I think Canadian, here, here's, here's the thing. You know, 90% of Canadian wine is sold in Canada. You know, only 10% does hit the export market. Uh, that being said, you know, I can get a nice selection of Canadian wine here. I've been in Germany. I've seen Canadian wine. I know Paz has told me she, she's had it occasionally, you know, on her list and, and, and Buenos Aires. So, you know, kind of depends on the song and, and a good importer to bring it in. Um, as far as being trendy, I think Cabernet Franc, in my opinion, is now trendy. It's trendy in Bulgari. It's trendy in Italy. And I think those trends get to lots of different people who are educated wine consumers who are interest in having something different you know i you know i think it's you know not just wonderful malbec but i thought you know some of the cabernet Franc that i had in argentina is just outstanding so i think it's a great that is really finally getting its recognition um, in certain areas in the world certain areas that are brave enough that are brave enough to plant it and brave enough to actually produce it so it's something that um niagara has always done and i think people are now understanding it and appreciating it now that they see other countries are doing it too. Is it mainly uh, varietals, uh, Michelle, or is there a bit of blending going on? Because in yeah, Argentina, Cabernet really Franc is yeah, proving to no. be an amazing partner to Malbec, yeah, but what's going no. on in Canada? Yeah, really, really, really good question. Um, most of the part is varietals. There okay. is, if somebody is producing Cabernet Sauvignon, they will blend it. So a lot of, and, 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 and in Ontario, in Niagara, that will be Cabernet Franc. 
uh, but there is more Merlot in, uh, in British Columbia. So there might be, there's a lot of blends there with Merlot in British Columbia. So, but I would say Cabernet Sauvignon is more, it's more a Bordeaux blend. If you're looking at anything, that'll be the one blend. Other than that, you are looking at single varietals. And it's and just- is that for the obvious, is that for yeah. the obvious reasons that Cabernet doesn't ripen every single year? Exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 It's, un it's unusual that producers in Ontario took a risk and produced a single varietal Cabernet Franc. I think it's unusual. Like, you know, you've had 30 bench, you've had a couple of them that have just, really stuck with it in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, and, you know, we've got age now in Cabernet Franc, which is, which is important as well. We've got some older vines and we've got some age. Um, and I look at, I think the popularity with ice wine, I think that has helped the name recognition that this is a great, so I think that helps as well, very much so. Okay. Um. I'm not sure I understand, Monica, what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will um, I will say what the questions is. Oh, all right. So you can. They want to see your lovely face, Michelle. So oh, they can. can. They take, can't see my face. Get is that out it? if you want to get out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll no, stop sharing. Is that it? There we time. go. There we go. Hi. Um, <laughs> I can see my Canadian flags Michelle. in the back. Yay. I'm good to say, Michelle, that whilst you were talking, I took the time to take a look around at the faces of the audience as well. So um, I have a few questions for the audience because I've seen some stuff. I, I guess, Alejandro Darago, you're the one who asked the question about Cabernet Franc because I saw you, um, you know, frantically nodding. At, uh, at the question that it was in Canada or not. I love that picture of the vineyard behind. I think Maria Mendizabal, you were invaded by a little child. I don't know how much you picked up on what Michelle was saying at that point. So if you need a bit of you know, refreshment afterwards, let us know. And I have a question for Malvi, if Monica, you can help me out, because where are you, Malvi? Malvi Medina, in which part of the world are you? Because it looks like you have a fan on and your hair has been blowing throughout the whole presentation. And I've been trying to figure out what is going on with you. I can see your hairs. <laughs> can you see her, Michelle? <laughs> anyway, that's a bit of fun. Michelle, it's been super interesting. I have to say that my knowledge on, on Canada had to be, you know, thoroughly refreshed for your presentation and I've learned lots. You've taken us through, um, through a lot and, and the information you have about Canada is incredible. You know, you clearly, clearly, clearly know your stuff. And there's no question that can, you know, not be answered by you. So thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other question. Ah, oh, there you go. Venezuela. So Malvi is in Venezuela, which I guess is much hotter <laughs> than here because I wouldn't have my fan on here. Um, I, I, if anyone has a question, this is the time. Um, I think for me, I've tasted um, um, Canadian wines in the past and I've even worked for a company that owned like the famous iconic wine from Canada, but it's it's been great to understand what they taste like and what what's behind. So all this water influence on this lake, which is pretty unique, and uh, and the food and everything that goes around. When I was um, and you will tell me, I didn't know this, um, Michelle, but Canada has a lot of food inventions. I was reading about that and I was quite surprised. Um, the chewing gum was invented. That's not, that doesn't qualify as food, but um, uh, obviously you have the maple syrup, but things like instant mashed potatoes and peanut butter was invented in Canada, of all yes, places. I, I bring over uh, peanut butter. 
Yes, I bring over peanut butter with me. Yeah. Well, I, I, my husband did a bit of work in Canada and, and mine was maple syrup because it doesn't taste the same than when you buy it off the shelves in London. I, I have a, a theory. But anyway, clearly a, a very different place and a very unique place with lots going on. It's quite new as well. If you look at, it's very old with all the local grape varieties, but it's very new with all the viniferas and what's going on right now and all the changes and the finding the right places. So um, I hope everyone is joining me in, in, um, in, in this thought that it's been really, really interesting and you don't get the chance to learn about Canada very often. So, well, I will, I will give a so plug. Much. So I, I don't know if anybody knew, but the Cool Climate Symposium was supposed to be in Canada this summer in Niagara. So unfortunately it couldn't happen because of COVID. So, so hopefully that will happen if anybody is able to get to Toronto and get to Niagara. So. Um, they were they were so excited to be able to host this symposium people around the world and uh, and uh, yeah next year next summer next summer so I think it's we we all on hold for a year or so <laughs> yeah, so it's absolutely. understandably Matthias I think it's over to you now yeah sure we are you haven't been muted yeah <laughs> by Monica. I mean, yeah, as, Ma as Marina said, uh, well, of course, thank you very much, Michelle, but it's, it's very interesting to know uh, a little bit more about Canada because uh, at the beginning was uh, only related to ice wine and in the last few years, uh, most things are happening. So this information is very valuable for, for all sommeliers in Argentina. So thank you, Michelle, for your time, for preparing uh, this masterclass and and of course, Marina, uh, as I said at the beginning, for all the all the times and the occasions we we invite you, you are always with us with all the summaries. My pleasure. Very important.